area. I think it should never be suppressed. I think we should learn about it, we should talk about it, and I say those things because if you don't know your history, it's a very, very, very great chance that you can repeat your history. So I think um, all things aside, whether it's uh, specifically talking about slavery, treatment of black individuals, whatever it is, I think it should be restricted. I shouldn't, it shouldn't be restricted because someone feel a different way. Or someone feel like uh, they don't want to talk about this because it puts one group of people in a different light or it makes one group of people look bad over the other. I think our history is our history. We, we don't need to do anything to suppress it. Uh, we just need to have our history the way it is, the way it was made, so we can all learn from it. I mean, we have to have these uh, critical and hard conversations uh, because if we don't, uh, our kids don't understand the struggles that we go through. Our kids don't understand um, the things that our forefathers and our ancestors had to go through. So I think. Those things should definitely not be suppressed, not be restricted in our school system. <clears throat> yeah, so a few you know points on it that um, it's it, it is a made up issue uh, by the, the right way to distract from real issues uh, instead of talking about healthcare and jobs and and, and real education uh, that's going to empower students. Right, it's something that that was made up to try to score political points. Um, it, uh, critical race theory of what it truly is is not even taught in K through 12. It's rarely even taught in undergrad. Um, I've learned about it a little bit in law school. There was a class on uh, specifically on on school uh, segregation um, and looking at those cases. And we, we looked at critical race theory in that class. Um, it wasn't even specifically called that. Um, but say that to say that that all of this talk and this you know, made up fabricated fear uh, that children are being taught critical race theory itself is just not true. Um, but should we be teaching you know true honest history uh, to students? Of course, it needs to be age appropriate. Um, but that doesn't mean that that you should um, you know. It's interesting that you know who's actually you know uh, participating in cancel culture. Uh, in this situation, it, it's those that are afraid of, of telling the truth. Uh, when the state school board uh, voted on their, you know, ban on it, um, I spoke there in my behalf as someone who's, you know, on behalf of, of you know, being Jewish, and I said that, you know, I grew up uh, from as early as I can remember learning about the Holocaust. Right, and at times it was uncomfortable. At times uh, it was really disturbing. But it didn't, one, you know, make me ashamed or embarrassed of who I am. Uh, it didn't make me feel that I was inferior, that other people, uh, you know, as a whole were bad. Uh, but it, it was just the truthful history of, you know, what my people went through. And if anything, it, it made me that much more proud of my background and identity. And I said this at the state school board meeting. I think that the people that are trying to pass uh, these bills and, and ban it, that's what they're afraid of, right? That if people really know their history, and embrace it and they're empowered, uh, that is a threat to the status quo. Um, so I, I think just knowing what, what the motivation is behind it and you know, exposing young people uh, you know, to, to that history is just so that, that we, you know, I know it's cliche, but we don't repeat it again. Right? Some of the, the language uh, that we're hearing now in, in Russia uh, from Putin and from others, uh, you can almost verbatim put that side by side with things that Hitler said. And just, you know, if we don't teach that history and look at that language and understand what happened, well, then we'll, we'll get confused and, and not understand, you know, what really happened. And the, you know, last part I'll say about it is, um, you know, at the Holocaust Museum in, in Washington, D.C., uh, there's a, they have from uh, Deuteronomy, the, the line, and I'll paraphrase, that says, uh, you know, so you never forget what your eyes have seen. You need to teach, you know, what you have seen to your children and your children's children, right? And, and that is a core tenant uh, in the Bible. Uh, it is a re there's a reason that is in there that we need to teach history. Uh, so for people that that claim to, to really be uh, such good Christians, uh, you know the word right there says that, that we need to teach it. Um, so again, it's it's made up. Uh, I hope that that the legislature can focus on real education issues uh, that really are important. Thank you both. So I'll have I have 
one last question and then we'll turn it to our audience for questions. So start getting your questions ready, uh, audience. Alabama has received a substantial amount of money from the American Rescue Plan Act, um, causing an increase in the general fund and educational budget. How do you think the funds should be spent within your district? Um, specifically in, in my district, um, there are uh, quite a few different needs than some of the other districts that are in the state of Alabama. Uh, specifically um, in Lyons County, um, if, if you guys are not aware, there's a 60 minute study, I mean, 60 minute um, broadcast done in Lyons County where it talks about. Um, when I talk about those quality of life issues, we talk about uh, clean, water, <coughs> clean drinking water and, and, and people not having a proper uh, sewage and sanitation uh, system to dispose of their solid waste. Um, and that ties right back into uh, the health and welfare of, of our citizens. Um, and so we were able to, uh, because of that and because of the attention that we've gotten, we was able to actually uh, get an appropriation done uh, for that specific entity. And it's it's just a drop in the bucket of what it's gonna actually cost. Um, but more specifically, I think in, in my district as, as a whole, if we focus on those things um, like infrastructure, um, I mean, this, this money can be used for a vast variety of things, whether it's infrastructure. I mean, it can even be used to, to uh, provide for education. Um, a lot of it is going to for infrastructure, um, roads and bridges, um, health care. Um, it's, it's no reason why the state of Alabama hadn't expanded Medicaid. Uh, it's, it's no reason. We, we have another opportunity with this tranche of money to get right. Um, and, and we say this all the time. Um, our people deserve our best. And we shouldn't let special interests, or we shouldn't let anyone else determine the difference between our people having and our people not having. Um, so uh, there are, are several things that are on the table in terms of what this money could be used for, um, from broadband, health care, uh, propping up our hospitals, nursing homes for being devastated by COVID. Um, all those things have a net effect on our people. So I think if we really just focus on um, what it's gonna take to get uh, our people up to the standard they need, and then go into these meetings trying to appropriate this money based on the needs of the community and not the needs of our special interest groups, whatever it may be. And you're asking about the, the COVID funding that's still coming. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, a, a few things and, and agree with Representative Lawrence. You know, one, mental health services. Um, you know, we, we, I think in California, uh, just the way they're trying to recruit teachers uh, right now, that they're focusing on you know, trying to have mental health counselors in every school. And I think their goal is to hire 10,000. Obviously, California has a lot more schools uh, than we do. Uh, but using some of that that COVID you know funding to to hire mental health counselors uh, to be in the schools you know, right now uh, they either rotate around or there's a guidance counselor uh, but to truly have someone that's there every day uh, that can work with with students uh, would be you know one use of it um, you know we saw with some of the early COVID funding uh, some of the small business loans and you know that was was helpful as far as keeping certain businesses open and going. Uh, but for those who really did take a loss, uh, especially restaurants uh, in the district or entertainment venues, um, you know, we have a bowling alley uh, right off of, of Atlanta Highway, right? All those activities that people didn't do as much during the pandemic, I think doing a, another round uh, of targeted, you know, small business funding uh, for businesses, uh, you know, especially minority and women owned, uh, you know, would be very helpful. Uh, a third, you know, part of it would be teacher incentives. Uh, and you know whether it was 
uh, for being in the classroom when it was uh, even you know, more high risk and they were going in every day, uh, you know, some sort of a bonus or incentive to, to continue working uh, and retain teachers. Um, and, you know, lastly, though, I think, you know, conflict resolution programs, uh, you know, we saw, we've seen during the pandemic, uh, how much just being in the house or, you know, having financial troubles or health issues uh, has made you know, all of us even be uh, more on edge. So I think that, that using COVID training uh, for conflict resolution uh, training would, would be an appropriate use as well. Excellent. So now we'll turn to our um, audience. If you all have questions. Say, or feedback or anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 like questions, reflections, I like feedback. This. I like this group. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's your definition of a public servant? And what are the things that you either already done or plan to do to show that you are not just a politician that gets elected and then you just enjoy the perks and just you know, take the role for yourself. What do you want to show that you're doing before the people? Okay. So I will start with, with, with and this would explain that your, it would kind of answer your uh, question and your explanation that I'm going to give. So I think a public servant is, is one that simply is, should be there to serve serve those that that elected us. And I'll give you an example. I've been um, campaigning and running um, races for since 2012. And I always hated and some people say, well you have to get out and I always hated when people would come to my church only doing campaign season. You only see them in the community when it's campaign season. You only see them at uh, neighborhood outings when it's campaign season. You only see them at neighborhood association meetings when it's campaign season. And so I said to myself, if I'm elected, this was in 2014, if I was elected in 2014 and I hadn't went to any church after I was elected, if I had gone to any community organization, any community involvement, between 2014 and 2018, they wouldn't see me when it's time for re-election. Because I felt like I didn't do what I was supposed to do as a public servant to engage with those people. So I didn't show up. So I adopted that when I was reelected in 18, from 18 to 2021, I did my campaign. I showed up to meetings. I got engaged with the community. I got involved with uh, situations. I got involved with uh, community service. I got involved with uh, nonprofit organizations. So when it came to 2020, I wasn't as face that you just see because it's election time again. Because I always hated those people that you only see them when it's time for you to ask for their vote. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, public servant, that right, that no matter what someone's title is or whether they've donated to a campaign or haven't donated, uh, that if you are truly serving the public, uh, that you're giving all of your constituents, all of your residents, uh, the same attention, the same time, and the same effort, um, right? If, if you're uh, there just to serve special interests, then you're not serving the, the public as a whole. Uh, and you know, the distinction, I would say, between someone who's a politician and someone who's in, in public service um, is that politicians at times, right, get very caught up in, in the title, uh, you know, can get caught up in, in going to, to some of the, the fancier and kind of, uh, you know, the perks of, of being in office. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, uh, you know, it's a, a way to, to meet people. Uh, but right, as long as that, that you are just as equally 
uh, rolling up your sleeves and doing the work uh, and talking to people, uh, no matter what their influences or, or their title, and, and connecting them to, to resources. You know, a lot of people uh, you know, just, they don't necessarily want to know all the details of legislation. Uh, they don't want to you know, hear about the bickering of, of you know, who said what and who did what. They just want to be connected uh, to whatever resource or have their issue solved. Uh, it, it could be as simple as they want to know if, if they want to have, you know, uh, in their neighborhood want to get a speed bump because cars fly by. They just want to know, do they talk to their city council member? Do they talk to the state? Uh, so if you're really serving the public, right, you're not going to think, oh, well, that's a small issue or that person, uh, you know, isn't well known. You're, you're going to give that, that issue the same time and, and effort um, as any you know, other person in your district. That answer. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Kevin and Phil, I heard you mention a special interest group. What thing came to my mind was the lottery group. And that was a limo that we don't know what we made the decision of what. Light us on that. So um with with, with the, the lottery legislation. Um, to be honest and frank, uh, it's, it's, it's the interest of the casinos that's blocking um, the lottery uh, because they feel like they can't get casinos legalized without having the lottery or without the lottery being included or the casinos being included with the lottery being. So, there's not a, a real taste for casinos in the state of Alabama, but there is an appetite for a lottery that would go for education or some other uh, purposes, whether it's education and uh, to use for other purposes, whether infrastructure or some other resources. Uh, so at the present moment, the lottery bill is simply put being held up or held hostage by those interests that are interested in casinos. They feel like they can't get casinos legalized without coupling it in with the lottery, simply put. Um, and I think uh, in order to defeat that, we have to start now calling our representatives, talking to our senators, and, and, and voicing our opinion that we as people want to vote for a lottery. You know, whether it's casinos involved in it or whether they're not. We want to vote for a lottery because right now, citizens of the state of Alabama, we're educating kids in Tennessee. We're educating kids in Mississippi. Mm. We're educating kids in Georgia. All of our surrounding states have a lottery with some type of proceeds going to education. And I think that it's a catalyst for us kind of uh, undergirding our education system. Uh, that's, that's revenue that's estimated at over $474 million that can uh, Yeah, I'll just quickly on that point, they're right. It, it's, and the special interest in that situation of right protecting uh, their bottom line, and that's I understand that people right if they're in business, but when there's an opportunity to have a funding source, uh, you know, right to, to better fund our public education or to have college scholarships for students, that right we can't let special interests like the casinos get in the way of that. Um, and something that you know people have opened my eyes to is that you know in the past when they have been funded. Uh, religious organizations or leaders to make it a, you know, uh, talk about it as a religious or moral issue. Uh, so then you had some uh, people in the state who, you know, didn't even think about it as, oh, it's a special interest as far as the casinos, but they saw it as, oh, wow, well, this is a religious issue and it's immoral to gamble or to, uh, you know, uh, spend money on, on lottery tickets. So just even being transparent about, right, who's funding what uh, campaigns uh, and making sure that, that we know who's behind what. Yeah. 
Yes, I have a hard question for the candidates. Y'all ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay. No, this is an easy question, really. Okay. Whether you are elected or re-elected to the position, what would you do in your first 30 days of office? So uh, to bring it to two, uh, so two things. Um, you know, one that um, having a, 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 a constituent services program, uh, you know, people that are in the state house, uh, you know, share staff uh, or have very limited access to staff. But thinking about even if we have to get creative uh, as far as how we fund it, having a program, and it could even be uh, you know with young people as far as interns. Um, Arche Johnson at the City Council does a, and Rhonda Mitchell, they do a great job of this, of having young people kind of be constituent, uh, you know, liaison. So having just a, a resource hub where people in the district, uh, of course, can, you know, reach out to me, uh, but also make sure that we have, you know, other staff and people in place that can, can help them, you know, uh, address some of their issues. Uh, and second, you know, something that really opened my eyes during the pandemic was the way our public health system was set up in Alabama. Uh, Jefferson County and Mobile County have uh, their own public health commissioners. And Montgomery, though, we're part of, I think it's like a 10 or 12 county uh, district where we have an administrator, uh, doesn't have a public health background, doesn't necessarily think about things through that public health lens, thinks about it more from a bureaucratic standpoint and logistics, which is you know, helpful at times. But what I would wanna do in those first 30 days uh, is put together uh, a local bill. Uh, hopefully there's support from the local delegation to have uh, a, a public health commissioner for Montgomery County and someone who's really focused on uh, delivering services in an equitable way, uh, someone who has that public health background to address some of our issues here uh, instead of just an administrator who's you know, trying to go uh, between you know, a whole bunch of different counties. Thank you. So, I don't plan to lose the election, so we're not going to talk about what I'd be doing if I lost the election in the 30 days. But uh, an initiative that that I started on this year. So as of right now, I'm the chairman of the House Montgomery County delegation. It's a, a seven-member um, delegation, and so we've embarked on this um, journey to to create a delegation office. And what this delegation office would entail is um, an office where um, constituents can come in, constituents can call, um, it would have um, information about constituent services, whether it's trying to figure out uh, who you need to contact if you need it, if you have an issue relative to social security, or if you have an issue relative to something um, dealing with um, I would say a probate issue that's specifically tied to um, the legislative process. Um, or if you just have general questions as it relates to, uh, I'm new in the area and I'm looking for a pediatrician or I'm looking for a specific type doctor. This office will be specifically designated for constituent services. And it's kind of ironic, kind of ties in right to what, what Philip was talking about, just having this office because right now if 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 either one of you guys wanted to ask a question about the legislative process or how this bill is, is, is passed or how this affects you uh, you have to at least I hope you can be able to reach out to your representative and they can give you but this will be a centralized um, location where you can call you can you can come in you can you can voice your opinion or you can get help with any specific service. Um, not necessarily saying that this office will be able to um, kind of solve your problem, but it will put you in on the right path or it'll give you direction or uh, incentive on where you need to go to try to get those type of things uh, situated. So we're working with uh, the county commission and on the city of Montgomery to actually try to create a, a funding source to actually um, get this office started. But it's looking very promising. But I think if I'm not uh, reelected, I think it's something that some other members in the delegation could pick up and continue to try to um, mm -hmm. get it done. Because we've had, uh, in, the, in the legislature right now, it's 105 members in the House of Representatives. 
and we have to share a clerk with 10 other representatives. So you know it's not that much work really getting done or it's not really effective in terms of um, if I have five or six constituents that's calling, needing some assistance, and then I have other administrative stuff that I need to try to get done, then you have nine other representatives that are doing the same thing for one clerk. It's really hard. Uh, by the time the session is over, you, you probably only accomplished half of the things that maybe three or four of the representatives that you're actually working with um, has kind of set out for you to do. So I think having here specifically in Montgomery County, having an office that's staffed with maybe three to five people to actually kind of um, engage and be involved. And these people are not just, uh, they be specific um, trained to, to, to uh, deal with different disciplines, whether it's uh, Social Security, whether it's Medicaid, whether it's Medicare, whether it's um, uh, any services relative to county or city. It's kind of, I wouldn't call it a one-stop shop, but just from a legislative perspective, providing that, that uh, I guess, education and that informative and, and, and kind of uh, system to um, the citizens of Montgomery to, to really kind of get them in, more engaged and, and kind of having a place where they can kind of know that if I call here, I'm going to get my state representative or I'm going to get my, my senator. Or if I don't get it, it's a place where I'm going to get someone from that office. As of right now, county in Montgomery doesn't have that centralized place. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we are um, almost at our time. And what I'd like for um, the two of you to do in two and a half minutes, if you will just close um, and highlight um, the importance of your election and what it means for the communities that you serve. Well, I think all elections are important, specifically because I wouldn't be sitting here without the sacrifice of the people that came before me and lost their life, bled, died for the right to vote. And we just haphazardly uh, sometimes kind of really kind of doesn't take <coughs> our voting rights as serious as we should. We always figure out it's some other reason why or some other uh, excuse for not voting. I think um, we owe it to those that came before us uh, to exercise our right to vote in any election. Not saying um, who you should vote for, unless it's me. <laughs> but we should exercise our right to vote. Uh, uh, we all know voting should have been a God-given right, but here in America it wasn't. We had to fight for our right to vote. Uh, so I think uh, everybody should take uh, the initiative. If, if you're able-bodied and you're of good sound mind and good health, shouldn't anything get in the way of you exercise your right to vote. Thank you for that. Well, yeah, thank you everybody for, for coming out. Um, you know, two two main uh, reasons why I think uh, it's so important, uh, this, this race uh, in District 74. So one, uh, and it's a rare opportunity here where the district now means Democratic. Uh, and if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, uh, I'd be honored to, to represent uh, everyone in the district, uh, whatever their political background, uh, and also in the election, you know, I, I welcome the support uh, of anybody that wants to see Montgomery and Alabama move forward. And But it, it is a, a rare uh, and historic opportunity here uh, where we can uh, add to the, the Democratic uh, minority at, at the State House. Um, I know uh, it's frustrating at times uh, being in the minority, uh, but there are things that, that we can do uh, to make sure that, that we stand up uh, you know, against some of the things that are being done. Uh, even if it is having one more Democrat in there to try to add amendments uh, to some of the bills, uh, I know that, that Senator uh, Smitherman uh, in these last couple of days spoke as much as he could against every bill uh, just to, to delay the time so that the Republicans had less time to, to vote on certain things. 
Uh, so using some of those, those tactics, uh, even though we're, we'd be in the minority, um, it, it's so important uh, that right now in, in this race uh, that we try to get out there uh, and, and flip the district, uh, again, not just for, for you know, partisan reasons, uh, but to make sure that at the state house there's someone who is going to to fight and fight and advocate for public education uh, and fight for mental health services and so many of the, the things we've discussed um and i, I don't want to sound uh hyperbolic about it but but lives do uh, uh you know are, are going to be impacted by it uh you know right now there were two bills that passed the session uh one we spoke about the permit was carry bill uh the one that that hasn't gotten as much attention uh, that's, that did pass and was signed into law uh, that says that the state of Alabama will ignore federal gun law. Uh, and just yesterday, uh, President Biden issued an executive order uh, to make it easier for law enforcement and district attorneys uh, to go after what they call these ghost guns. So when people order pieces online and put together their own guns, uh, the state of Alabama uh, passed a law that says we're going to ignore uh, federal law. Uh, now, you know, one, I didn't have to go to law school to learn this. Uh, it's unconstitutional when a state says they're not going to follow federal law. Uh, maybe if we taught proper history, uh, some representatives would know uh, that when Alabama ignores state law, it never ends well for Alabama. Uh, so having someone in there who just knows uh, that we shouldn't waste time on, on legislation that's going to be overruled, uh, having to defend lawsuits, uh, that money could be going uh, to the residents of the district and the state. Um, but it's not just about politics. It's not about, you know, do you support, uh, you know, gun rights or not. Uh, you know, there are people in the district um, that have lost their lives to, or have lost family members to gun violence. Uh, just this past Sunday uh, in Chisholm, I uh, 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 saw the grandfather of a young man, uh, Shaquille Johnson, uh, who was at Lee. Uh, he was the same year as Alan, and, and he passed away uh, from gun violence in 2018. And what his grandfather, you know, said to me was, and, and we went inside, and he, right inside, they have um, his jersey.